Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give his blessings and benediction upon our beloved Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his household, his companions, and the Muslims the world. Uh, today uh, is a very special day for me personally. When I heard that Mr. <coughs> Munir, uh, Mufti Munir is around, uh, I was extremely happy to see him, meet him, because of what I know about him. I remember a few years back, I was with Mufti Munir in Hajj, to actually perform Hajj together. And before that, I went on a journey to seek knowledge. I was in Saudi Arabia, and he was translating to those who do not speak Arabic language. So he was with many scholars. <clears throat> he was with many, many scholars. He has, subhanAllah, I, I remember at the time he was at the University of Medina, I believe. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> we always loved him. We loved him so much, a young uh, brother from America who uh, has engaged himself so much with many scholars and associated himself with many scholars. So his mind is very open. I haven't watched any of his videos when someone was telling me about him, but when I told the president of the masjid and the people of the masjid, they started watching the video of his lectures, with which they enjoyed so much. Uh, I used to speak to him and I even asked him some questions. Uh, because he has uh, associated himself with so many scholars and he has, mashallah, been with them for uh, so many years. <clears throat> and uh, when you see someone, when you see a scholar, or a scholar who is also with scholars, I believe uh, some scholars have taught us that even looking at people of knowledge itself is ibadah. we looking at them with the eyes of honor because they deserve all the honor. So we celebrate uh, seeing him, we celebrate what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given him of talent and of knowledge. Of, uh, with my little knowledge, I know how much Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed him with. And the knowledge itself is not enough, as you know. Uh, when you see someone who has the understanding, when you're asking someone questions about different things that you're going through and is able to answer your question in a very knowledgeable and understanding way, that is another blessing also. I've also been with him for a few days, you know, we've been with him for a few days and you see how he's behaving, what he's doing, uh, even giving lecture, talking is different from the way some people behave. When you see the match, between these two is another blessing entirely. So we are extremely happy to have Ustel uh, Mukti Munir with us. I, to be honest with you, I know his value. I know what he worth. He may even worth more than what I know. Uh, his efforts and journey from one place to the other. Uh, may Allah know, seeking knowledge and being with the scholars. May Allah continue to bless him. May Allah continue to bless his knowledge. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as he guided him, he's an American born, he's an American. But Allah guided him towards knowledge uh, to the extent that, uh, inshallah. So we pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless our children also to be like him even better than him, inshallah. Without any further ado, inshallah, I will let the uh, Monil, uh, give us lectures, lecture for our children and for us parents also, for our children because uh, as we know, the danger here in terms of our Iman, of our faith, how the faith, how faith fade out so quickly. So, inshallah, he will illuminate our hearts with what Allah has shown him with of knowledge. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Inna alhamdulillah. 
نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أرسله الله تعالى بالهدى ودين الحق ليظهره على الدين كله وكفى بالله شهيدا فبلغ رسالة ربه وأدى أمانته ونصح لخلقه ولعباده وجاهد في سبيله إلى أن أتاه اليقين فصلى الله عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه وذريته وأزواجه وأهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين ومن سار على منهاجهم واقتفى بأثرهم إلى يوم الدين أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته عليكم السلام قال الإمام أحمد رحمه الله تعالى في مسنده حدثنا يزيد بن هارون قال حدثنا حريز قال حدثنا سليم بن عامر عن أبي أمامة رضي الله عنه قال إن فتى شابا أتى النبي صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وسلم فقال يا رسول الله إذن لي بالزنا فأقبل القوم عليه فزجروه وقالوا مه مه فقال دنوه فدنا منه قريبا قال فجلس قال أتحبه لأمك قال لا والله جعلني الله في دائك قال ولا الناس يحبونه لأمهتهم قال أفتحبه لابنتك قال لا والله يا رسول الله جعلني الله في دائك قال ولا الناس يحبونه لبناتهم قال أفتحبه لأختك قال لا والله جعلني الله في دائك قال ولا الناس يحبونه لأخواتهم قال أفتحبه لعمتك قال لا والله جعلني الله في دائك قال ولا الناس يحبونه لعماتهم قال أفتحبه لخالتك قال لا والله جعلني الله في دائك قال ولا الناس يحبونه لخالاتهم قال فوضع عليه أو فوضع يده عليه وقال اللهم اغفر ذنبه وطهر قلبه وحصن فرجه فلم يكن بعد ذلك الفتى يلتفت إلى شيء. My dear brothers and sisters in Allah's Khalim, there's a proverb that I've read some years back and I would say is well known among many Americans, black or white people that live in the United States. Whether they have traveled outside of the United States or not, whether they have been to the continent of Africa or not, whether they have direct roots or indirect roots to the African continent or not, but it's a pretty famous statement, a very wise proverb that is attributed to Africa. Is it attributed to West Africa, North Africa, Central Africa, South Africa, Northeast Africa? Al-Muhim, they call it an African proverb. And this proverb is one of the most famous, if not the most famous proverb that you'll hear coming from the African continent for an, an American. Whether they've been to the continent or not. Whether they have roots and family ties there or not. And the proverb goes as following. They say it takes an entire village to raise a child. It takes an entire village to raise just one child. Now me, myself, I've been to Africa, but obviously not every single country. I've only been to a small part and a small section of that large continent. But everyone knows this statement. If you grow up, you go to school, in elementary school, in middle school, in high school, on the television, wherever you go, you'll see this wise statement. When they have statements of the Romans, of the Greeks, of the Egyptians, of this one, of that one, even though Egypt is a part of Africa, but we're talking about what the people use and classify, okay? Africa is one thing and Egypt is something else, even though it's one continent. So everyone knows this statement. It takes one village to raise one child. So the statement means, now I don't know how authentic this statement is, but what I've understood from the statement growing up and having children and traveling and dealing with different uh, people, different walks of life, is that, that raising a child can't be done by just the mother. Raising a child can't be done by the father. Raising a child cannot be done by mother and father. Raising a child cannot be done by a household. 
Raising a child cannot be done by someone who's old and wise and experienced. Raising a child is needed by an entire village. And the next thing that I've understood from this statement is that everyone can't raise this child and contribute to the life of this child at one point. Obviously, there are going to be certain people that will raise the child from day one, rather before the child is even conceived. And after the child is conceived, the child being in the womb of the mother, everyone can't raise this child. There's only going to be a limited amount of people. And then when a the child is born, and the child thinks that the child experiences and goes, and goes through, and then becomes a toddler, and then two, and three, and four, and five, and six, and reach puberty, and leave the home, and seek and pursue its own direction in life, the school teacher, the scholar, Every person that this human being comes across on one level or another is responsible for raising this child. And I feel that this statement and this proverb is very profound and it is very Islamically applicable. Islamically applicable. Raising a child doesn't just come in the masjid or from the mother or the father or the imam or the sheikh. Protecting your children, keeping them upon the straight path, keeping them safe, from the many dangers that exist in this world today can't just be done through a lecture or through a talk. It can't just be done by you giving your child a good Islamic name and doing the aqiqah for the child and making dua for the child and feeding the child with the halal, the good provision and not the haram provision. Rather, it is an entire total congregational effort. Everyone has a responsibility and everyone bears a responsibility in doing two things. Number one is to keep the child upon its natural state. And number two is to allow the child to increase, to grow, and to mature in goodness. So right now, we have an iPad Pro, right? Many of us have this device or a Samsung tablet. When you get the tablet, when you get the iPad, the company is supposed to assure you that it's usable, and that it's ready, and that it comes with the necessary features and specifications. It's not broke, it's not damaged, it isn't malfunctioning, but it's ready for use. You as the consumer, as the purchaser, as the buyer, it is your job, it is your responsibility, or anyone else that's gonna use this device to maintain its soundness. How to charge the battery, how not to charge the battery, Water, dust, viruses, programs, space, storage, upgrade, software upgrade, update, and all of the things that you're supposed to do, screen protector, a case, to maintain the original soundness of the device that came to you in a perfectly sound manner. And that is the similitude of the child. And that's the similitude of al-Islam. And that's why we say every single day, ihdina sirat al-mustaqeem. Guide us to the straight path, i.e., O oh Allah, keep us upon what we're on now, because we're Muslim now. That's the original state. And give us even more, and keep us safe, and protect us from the things that would damage, that will injure, the things that may even, may Allah protect us, remove us from the blessing of Al-Islam. And that is how a child is born and raised. When a child came into this world, the child was pure. The child was clean. And not only, not only was it pure and clean, but the child was made to accept good. It was made with the natural inclination towards khair. But there's something that the child sees, or something that someone does to the child, or some outside foreign influence to the child, or the lack of the proper upbringing and raising and nourishment, physical, spiritual, or mental, that isn't given to the child that causes an error. Something goes wrong. When I bought the iPad, it was perfect, but I overcharged it, or I abused the battery, or dropped in water, or I cracked the screen, or I refused to update the software. I abused it, I did something, I didn't maintain it, so now there is a glitch, it cuts on and off. Now and it's slow. Now my personal information, my passcodes, 
my card information, everything is now in public. Something's wrong. But when Apple sent me the product and the device, nothing was wrong with it. And it isn't just about me, but anyone that's going to come in interaction with this tablet. It's my tablet. I tell my son, don't drop it on the floor. I tell my daughter, don't play it until the battery is 1%. Don't keep it charged and play it for days and so on and so forth because they're in interaction with it as well. And the same applies to the child. It is not just about the parent and the mother. It's not just about at a young age. It's not about talking about Islam and talking about the Sunnah and being righteous and being pious when your son is 18 and 19 and 20 years old. It's a bit too late right now. If the first time your child is hearing about these things and being taught about these things and they're in college, then oftentimes it may be too late. It's too late to look after your device now and it's already damaged. You were given the manual and the instructions on protecting it and keeping it safe and maintaining it from day one. And the Prophet ﷺ, he tells us about this. He says that every child is born ala al-fitrah. Kullu mawludin yuladu ala al-fitrah. Every child is born on the fitrah. And in the English language, there is no one equivalent for the word fitrah. If you translate it just to mean religion or deen, that's not absolutely correct. The fitrah, the best way that I can explain it in English, is what I said about the device. It's made for you to use it. It's made for you to download and it's made for you to benefit from. The iPad is made to make your life easier. It's made to make whatever you do in life easier, simpler, quicker, and faster. And for you to maximize the good that you seek to do. It has the ability to be used. It has the ability to go through this. It has the potential to help you out in any sphere or aspect of life that you're involved with. And that's the meaning of fitrah, is that the child automatically acknowledges Allah as its Lord. But obviously that's not enough. That's not enough for a child to grow up and to be raised as a Muslim, to acknowledge Allah, ha, alastu bi rabbikum, am I not your Lord? That's not enough. As the Prophet ﷺ tells us, in the hadith of Abu Dhar, in Sahih Muslim, the one on hadith, Allah says, kullukum dalun, he says, you're all astray. Each and every one of you is astray. Except for those whom I have chosen to guide. So beg for my guidance and I'll give it to you. So the hadith clearly shows that a human being is not upon the correct way until Allah makes him upon the correct way. And another hadith says, Kullu mawludin yuladu ala fitra. Every child is born upon a fitra. And a third hadith says, Hadith Qudsi, Allah Azza wa says, خَلَقْتُ عِبَادِي حُنَفَى فَاجْتَاحَتُمُ الشَّيْطِينَ Allah says, I have created my slaves, حُنَفَى I made my servants, every human being, Hanif until the shayateen snatched them. There's no contradiction between these narrations. The word fitra means that the child acknowledges Allah as his Lord and Master. The hadith means that the child is made to accept good and to be taught good, and to walk the straight path and do the right thing in life, if you take the necessary steps, if you make the necessary maintenance, and if you look after the rules and the restrictions of the device. That's what the fitra is. So on this iPad, I can read from the Musnad Imam Muhammad as I just did, or I can listen to music, I can watch a video, I can watch pornography, I can watch anything, download anything. I can read a book about sihr, sorcery, and magic, and wizardry. Or I read a book about the Sahaba. It's my discretion what I put on this device. It's my own choice how I treat this device. But if I have the device for many years, and I've neglected it, and I've abused it, and I haven't followed the necessary steps and instructions, and now it crashes, and I lose all of my books, I lose all of my videos. I lose all of my secret things and the personal things that I need and want. I take it to the electronic store. He's going to say, um, I can't really help you. You have to get a new iPad. The damage is too bad. I can't recover your lost files for you. It's, it's cheaper to get a new tablet. I say, no, I really need it. I need my stuff. I paid a lot of money. I had it for years. He says, well, the battery is ruined. The screen is cracked. The motherboard is damaged. There's a problem with this, there's a virus there, what were you looking at, what were you watching? If I pay attention to the tablet and the device, 
after it's too late, then the fixing of that problem and the recovering of those important things and those important files, the chances are slim to none. And this is the reality of raising children in the United States, in the world. But we're talking about our country, the United States. This is the reality, is that you cannot just give a lecture and a talk when your child is in puberty. You can't give a lecture and a talk to your child and tell him he's a man after he's a young man. And that's because it takes an entire village to raise one child. From day one to the end. Everyone has a responsibility and everyone has a duty and everyone has something that they must contribute to the success of this Abdullah and the success of this Amatullah. Of this male Muslim and this female Muslim. So with that being said, brothers and sisters in Al-Islam, what I want to discuss with you, I want to read to you uh, and conversate with you regarding is a beautiful hadith. It's one of the most favorite of the prophetic narrations that I can personally say for myself. And I've done many lectures on this hadith before, and I've also done a khutbah on this hadith before. And it's an example of how we should deal with our children. It is an example of how we should deal with our youth. It is an example of what we possibly could do even if we don't take the necessary steps in the beginning. Hmm? And the only way out is the prophetic wisdom. So the hadith goes as such. First and foremost, the hadith has been collected by Imam Ahmed, one of the great scholars of Al-Islam, who lived and died in the third century. Every Muslim knows Imam Ahmed, just like you know Imam Malik, Imam Shafi'i, Imam Abu Hanifa, and other great Imams of Al-Islam. Obviously, Imam Ahmed, he's similar to those Imams, but he's a bit different as well. Whereas some of the things that he went through and some of the sacrifices that he made were like no other Imam. Imam Ahmed was tortured. He was beaten. He was imprisoned. He was boycotted. He was locked up. And he was censured for no sin and no crime except that he refused to fold under pressure. And this could be the topic of discussion as well. Because one of the biggest reasons why children smoke drugs and have boyfriends and have girlfriends and get tattoos and disrespect their parents and join gangs and don't want to be a Muslim, one of the biggest reasons, not the only reason, is peer pressure. Peer pressure, bad company, being around bad colleagues that force them and pressure them into, come on, man, do it. Are you scared? Are you this? Are you that? He doesn't want to do it. He knows that it's haram. He knows that it's bad. But he doesn't want to be mocked and looked down upon by his peers. So they force him into doing it. They force him into smoking. They force him into drinking. They force him into making zina and breaking his virginity before wedlock. And then he does it once. And he's forced a second time and a third time. And then he eventually is now, his fitrah has been warped. And then he's inclined towards doing the evil. And oftentimes he may realize what he did was wrong and it was bad, but it may be too late. Now me personally, I've never been incarcerated. Well, alhamdulillah, I've never been locked up. Uh, but I have been to jail before. I've visited jails before. I've visited prisons before. Uh, speaking, giving classes and giving khutbahs and also visiting people, visiting people. The first time that I went to a jail, I probably was maybe 20 years old, roughly. Maybe 20, 21 years old, maybe, roughly. So I went to the jail and it was a juvenile jail. So they gathered all of the young brothers, 14 years old, 16 years old, 17 years old, 16 years old, all young brothers. Some of them were born Muslim. Some of them came from Muslim families. Some of them came from uh, uh, good families. And some of them accepted Islam later on. So we started talking to them. We gave them the khutbah. We gave them the class. We started speaking to them, getting to know them, and acquainting ourselves with them. So I asked them, I says, what are you doing here? Your face is so tender, so pure looking. You look innocent. What are you doing here? Why are you locked up? Why aren't you outside going to school, playing basketball? Why, why are you in a prison cell? And he says, well, I killed somebody before. And another one said, I did this, and I did that. And I asked another one, how long are you going to be? And he says, I don't know yet. He says, when I reach a certain age, then they'll treat me as a grown-up, and then they'll sentence me. And it was really sad, and it was really disheartening. And most of the people that you talk to that are in this jail, not because they wanted to be there, but because of peer pressure. They were forced, and they buckled. They didn't stand up to the pressure. So Imam Ahmed, rahimahullah, 
He was someone that refused to fall under the pressure. Now, we know before we get into the Hadith, brothers and sisters, that one of the greatest things to study uh, and one of the most beneficial and practical sciences that you can ever read about in life is history. History. The things that took place before we were even here. The men and the women who lived and died. Why they lived, why they died, and what happened. So when we read the Islamic history, we all know what happened in the third century. There was a time and a place in which the leaders of Islam, the leaders of the Muslims, the Khulafa, the Caliphs, they were influenced. And they began to say things and believe things. And then they felt that it was necessary and mandatory to force those thoughts and those beliefs upon other Muslims. And that was the belief and the system of belief called Ali Atizal. The system of Ali Atizal. And from those points were those who said that the Quran is created. Al Quran al Makhluk min Makhluqatillah. It's nothing but Allah's creation. It's not the words of Allah, but it's created. So they begin to believe this. And they begin to force others to believe that. And any scholar who refused to make this statement, even if he was a yani, mukran, he was forced to do it. But if he didn't outwardly bend and fold to what they were saying, they would beat him to death. They would lock him up. They would strip him of his rights and his power, and they would take everything away from him. But from the imams who refused to do this were a handful. A handful. And this also goes to show you the strength of Imam Ahmad rahimahullah, of this great scholar of Islam, this champion of Islam. Not only did he survive the torture and the beating and the imprisonment, but he had enough strength from Allah and enough willpower to live and outlast his enemy is that he made it to the grand meeting with the Khalifa. And which there were other scholars who were locked up with him and they died. They didn't have enough. He lasted to meet with him in person. So they asked him questions and they forced things upon him. He wasn't afraid, he wasn't scared, he wasn't nervous. He says, if you tell me something from the Qur'an and from the Sunnah that shows that I have to say what you're saying and that what you're saying is right, then I have no hesitation in making that statement. I'll say the Qur'an is created if you can just prove it to me from the book and from the Sunnah, but nothing else. And obviously there was nothing that they could say. Every verse that they tried to use, he would counter. And he would explain to them what's meant by it. Any hadith that they would try to use, he would counter. And he would explain to them scientifically, intellectually, that that's wrong. So they became frustrated with him and they beat him. And they abused him and they threw him back in jail. Until Allah Azza wa allowed him to be emancipated. So I'm not trying to get into the detailed life of Imam Ahmed. What's important is, is that there are many things that we can learn from this great scholar of Islam. So in his book, his collection of hadith called Al-Musnad, just like Imam Malik has al muwatta Imam Ahmed has Al-Musnad. It's a place in which hadiths are collected and arranged and put in some type of order. So from that which he mentions in this book, he says, Hadathana Yazid ibn Harun. Imam Ahmed, he reports from his teacher, his ustad, his sheikh. And the sheikh's name was Yazid ibn Harun. That was his teacher. And Yazid ibn Harun, or Harun, he narrated from a man whose name was Hariz, who narrated from Sulaym ibn Amir who narrated from Abu Umama, the companion. Just like Abu Huraira, Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, you all know this. So Abu Umama radiallahu anhu, he told us a story. He told us a story. And the story was during the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa He tells us, he says, one day, إِنَّ فَتَنْ شَابًا أَتَنْ نَبِيَّ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ فَقَالُ That one day a young man came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa A young man, a youth. 16 years old, 15 years old, 17 years old, 14 years old. He was young. He wasn't old. He wasn't a baby, but he was a young man. And he went up to the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu and obviously the Messenger of Allah, he's sitting with his companions. Abu Bakr and Omar, he's sitting with them. And what do you think that the young man came and asked or said or requested? Do you think the young man came up and said, Oh, Messenger of Allah, teach me about Salah. Tell me about Hajj. Tell me how to be good with my parents. Tell me what I can do of fun and recreation. Tell me about the Qur'an. That's not what he asked the Prophet ﷺ for. And this goes to show us, before we go further in the story, is that this young man had a great deal of courage. He wasn't afraid and he wasn't scared. Even if that courage and that lack of fear was a bit unwise and a bit foolish. But courage is like raw energy. 
It has to be honed and harvested until it can be turned to something that's iron. Iron is turned into steel. It's turned into other things that has to be burnt and molten. But just the raw energy is a good thing, and it can be used. And it's better of a chance of you molding a young person who has courage than you trying to mold someone who has no courage whatsoever. I'd rather take my chances with someone that has a hot temper, someone that's a little reckless and guide them and cultivate them than someone who has no courage whatsoever. Everyone understand this? So the young man, he was brave. So he went up to the Prophet and said to him, and guess what he said? Do you know what he asked him? He said, Ya Rasulullah, idhan li bizzina. He said, oh, messenger of Allah, allow me to fornicate. Allow me to have illegal sexual enjoyment. So just stop and think about this now. If I came into this masjid and I stood in front of me and said, hey guys, I want to make zina, how would you look at me? What would you think about me? So who is this guy he brought talking like this in front of people, children and women and elders? What type of respect does this man have? And he said this in front of the human being who deserved the greatest amount of respect, the messenger of Allah, the one upon whom the Qur'an was sent down day and night. And then after the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Abu Bakr and Omar and Uthman and these Sahaba, the young man, he was brave, but he had no respect. And he said, oh Messenger of Allah, allow me to make zina. That's very bold. Very bold. So obviously, you know what the people did. They looked towards him, they looked at him, and they said, meh, meh. What is this? A'udhu billah, astaghfirullah. What type of respect is this? They begin to censure the young man and blame him and come down upon him. But the Prophet ﷺ was a bit different than us. He's a bit different from them. His wisdom was deeper. His intelligence, his intellect was far greater. And he said, don't push the boy away. Don't chase him away. Don't say bad things to him. He said, tell him to come closer. Allahu Akbar. A young man who's coming to make zina, he wants zina, he wants the Messenger of Allah to make it halal. And he told him to do what? Come closer. The companions that have the greatest virtue, the best status with the Prophet, they are those that want to be what? Close. And he allowed a boy who's thinking about zina to come close. That's something that's totally unconventional. So he told the young man, he says, come close, come, sit down. And let's talk about zina, let's talk about it. The hadith then says, فَجَلَسَ So he sat down, close to him. قَالَ أَتُحِبُّهُ لِأُمِّكَ So the Messenger of Allah said, Salam, he asked him a question. And this goes to show us a very important tactic of raising children and keeping them safe when they're young and when they're in college. And that is not to run from the problem. Don't sweep it under the rug. Don't be hush-hush and taboo. No, my, my daughter, she doesn't like boys. Nah, nah, not my daughter. My daughter doesn't have a boyfriend. My son is not watching this. Nah, that's impossible. I stuck for the law. It's my son, Abdurrahman. He doesn't have an issue smoking. Nah, not my son. Nah, that's your son, not mine. This is how most of us behave because it's embarrassing. And oftentimes we have a great deal of pride and arrogance, which is one of the worst things for the human being to have. It's to have too much pride in which it blinds you from the basic truth. Everyone knows this about your son except for you. Because you refuse to accept it. So the Prophet ﷺ, he didn't run from the problem. Rather, he took it head on. Let's talk about it, son. Let's discuss it. You want to get a tattoo? All right, no problem. Let's talk about getting a tattoo. If you can prove to me why you should get a tattoo and how it makes sense, and the ruling on it, and you can pay for your own tattoo, I'll let you get it right now. Tattoos are haram, khalas. You run them away. In most cases, your son and your daughter, they're going to get a tattoo, and you're not going to know about it. But if you actually talk to them, and discuss it with them, and give them some respect, and mentally defeat them, and prove to them why it's bad to get a tattoo and how it doesn't make sense, they're not going to get a tattoo. Son, can you pay for the tattoo that you're trying to get? Yeah, I can pay for it. How are you going to pay for it? Do you have a job? Are you working? No, you give me money. Okay, I'm not paying for the tattoo. I'm not giving you the money for the tattoo. What are you going to do when you get old? How are you going to get a job? And run down the list of problems that come from getting a tattoo. And perhaps the son and the daughter will say, you know what? I don't want to get a tattoo anymore. That was the wisdom of the Prophet ﷺ. So he asked them. He asked them a hardcore question. He says, He says, would you like people to make zina with your mother? Would you be pleased with that? Would a man sleeping with your mother? That's not your father? It's a very hard question. 
obviously the young boy, no matter how much he wanted to make zina, he still has some good in him. And he has some common sense in him. He has some type of upbringing in him. He says, of course not, O Messenger of Allah. Abedin. I would never want to disrespect my mother like that. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make me your ransom. He said, He says, O Messenger of Allah, if you were captured and taken by the enemy, and the only way they would let you go was by them taking me, he says, then may Allah put me in that place. So it goes to show that he loved the Messenger of Allah. And he loved Islam, but he had strayed a little bit. And it's a very important point with regards to young men and women. Is that if they want to do one thing wrong or two things wrong, it doesn't mean that everything else is wrong. So use the good that they have with them and try to bring them back instead of pushing them further away. So the Prophet ﷺ, obviously after he cracked into the young man, he cracked him open now. He got into his head. He clearly said that he doesn't want his mother to be abused and disrespected and exploited. So that shows that the boy has some good and then he has some intelligence with him. And now in the Prophet ﷺ, he's going to exploit that now. He says, nasu yuhibbunahu li ummahatihim. He says, and the people don't like it done to their mothers as well. The people, they don't like it done to their mothers as well. So why would you go out and make zina and you could be making zina with someone's mother? She has children, she has family, she has a, a, a father, a mother, people to go home to at night with a shamed face. And you wouldn't want that for your household. So why would you treat someone how you don't like to be treated yourself? It's wisdom. The Prophet, he combated the boy's foolishness and lust with what? With hikmah, with wisdom. And then the Prophet ﷺ, that wasn't enough, like many of us would do. He didn't just stop there, one conversation that you have with your son about drugs. No, you need a follow-up. You need to talk more. You need to discuss it more. So he asked him another question. After the boy has submitted to the first one, he said, Afatuhibbuhu. He says, Do you like it for your daughter? Qala la wallah, ya Rasulullah. Ja'an illahu fidaka. He says, Oh no, Messenger of Allah, I don't like it for my daughter. Well, and nasu yuhibbuhu no li banatihim. No, the people like it for their daughters to be exploited. You make zina, that's someone's daughter that you're sleeping with. That's someone's daughter that you're not married to. That's someone's daughter that you're not respecting and promising to be her husband and be there for her. And that's shame, that's dishonor, and that's disgrace for someone's father or mother. And then he asked them the next question, and the third question, and the fourth question, and the fifth question. Do you like it for your sister? Do you like it for your aunt? Do you like it for your aunt? Do you like it for this one or for that one? And for each and every time, the young man, he said, Oh, of course not, O Messenger of Allah. May Allah make me your ransom. And then after the end of that discussion, the narrator, he says, He placed his head or his hand on his forehead. He put his, head, his hand on his head and he said the following supplications. Allahumma ghfir dhambahu. He says, oh Allah, please purify this young man from his sin. Forgive him of even thinking about making zina, let alone making zina. Of coming to me and asking this question in the manner in which he did. Forgive him for this. Wa-tahir qalbahu. And clean his heart. Get rid of the idea of zina from his heart and not just from the surface. Your son, he sneaks out, he gets a tattoo, you put him on punishment. You take money away from him. You tell him that you're upset and you're angry. That's only on the surface. You have to get to the root and the core of the tattoo. Why did you get a tattoo? Because I want to be accepted. Because I want to look cool. Because you didn't give me the necessary attention and now you are. You have to get to the core of the problem now, and that is the heart. The heart is the beginning and the end of every problem that we may possibly have as Muslims. The Prophet ﷺ, he says, Indeed, in the chest is a lump of flesh. You all know the hadith. He then says, And O oh Allah, please keep him chaste. Protect his private parts. Keep him safe and sound from anything which is illicit. The narrator, he says, after the Prophet ﷺ sat with him, spoke with him, talked with him, and made dua for him, he says that young man never ever did anything unbefitting. He walked the straight path after that engagement with the Prophet ﷺ and after that prophetic encounter. So let's stop and let's think and let's break down this hadith, brothers and sisters. The young man was righteous 
and he was upright and he did the correct thing, he pleased Allah ta'ala because of two things. Number one was with the Prophet Sallallahu critical dialogue. And number two, because of the Prophet Sallallahu spiritual supplication. So this should be a guide and a model for us. When something goes wrong, the first thing that we say is, oh, I'll make dua for you. I'll make dua for you. Make dua for me, which is a good thing. Making dua to Allah Azza wa Jal. The Quran and the Sunnah are full of this. There's no doubt about that. But we also have to try and strive the tangible means as well. And one of the greatest things and the strongest ways of getting across to someone and helping someone and fixing someone is not talking. Not talking. Most of you are thinking, no. But it's listening. And that's a problem that most of us don't, we fall into. We don't have the ability to listen. Before you finish your conversation and your discussion, I'm already criticizing you. I've already judged you. I've already told you to shut up and be quiet. That makes no sense. And I have not thoroughly listened to what you've had to say. I want a tattoo. No, tattoo. Laugh. That's it. Listen to him. He may tell you why he wants a tattoo. It may be a reason. It may be something that you can explain to him. It makes sense to him. Which will push him away from getting a tattoo or anything else with his haram that most an average teenager does today. Whether we accept it or whether we accept it not. I wouldn't understand this. So the Prophet said he taught us the very first thing to do is not to talk, is not to censure, is not to judge, but is to listen. And that is taken from the part of the hadith in which he says, Udun, he says, come close. I.e., you're too far away. Come closer. And it also instilled in the young man a sense of respect and a sense of value. You may live in a house, your mother, your father, the imam at the masjid, don't call me, don't reach out to me, you can't come into my office, you can't speak. I'm on a high pedestal and you're down here. Send me a message, send it through a second or third person. The Prophet said was approachable and he was the biggest and the greatest, but he was simply approachable and he wanted to teach the man, the young man, that you have some respect. And that's why I said, come closer to me and let me listen to you. And after he understood what he wanted to say, and he brought him close, and he gave him some respect, then he gave him even more respect by speaking to him intellectually. He didn't belittle him. He didn't make fun of him. He didn't say, you're a fasik, you're evil. How could you ask this question? But he spoke with him as if they were equals. And this is one of the greatest things that people complain about. I can't talk to my father. I can't talk to my mother. My mother doesn't listen to me. My father doesn't listen to me. They always make fun of me. They always look down upon me. So if we want true prophetic guidance, then we have to take the prophetic guidance. And he asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, Allahumma ghafir dhambahu. Oh Allah, clean him spiritually. Clean him spiritually. Wutahir qalbu wa hasan farjahu. And clean him physically as well. So this hadith, in my humble opinion, it can be used as a template, and it can be used as a model for probably any problem that you can come across with regards to your teenage son or your teenage daughter. If they're in college, if they're going to college, or they're younger than that. Preventative measures, as we said, first and foremost is who you marry in Al-Islam. If you're not married yet, and you're looking to get married, akhi or ukhti, then you must be extremely selective. Be selective. The Prophet والسلام, he told us, he says, The four things that a woman can be married for, i.e. in most cases. They don't, they're more than four. But in most cases, the average man is going to marry a woman for one of these four reasons. Anyone want to explain, you can marry her because she's beautiful. Or on the surface, a shallow-minded person. There's nothing wrong with having a beautiful wife or a handsome husband. But only, that's it, just because she's beautiful. You marry her for her money. You marry her for her background, her lineage. She comes from a good family this leader, this influential person, this politician, etc. He said at the end of the hadith, walidiniha, and marry her, she can be possibly married for her religion. He says, I advise you, and the point that I give you is the last, and that's the religion. If she's not well-rounded, she's beautiful and religious and from a good family, and she's wealthy, but if there's something that sticks out, one distinguishing thing that's stronger than the others, then let it be the religion. 
He says, and may your right hand become dusty. In other words, as if he told him, good luck. As if he told him, good luck. Not meaning luck of shirk and kufr, superstition, but the concept of good fortune, bit tawfiq. May you be blessed. And may Allah make it easy for you to find this religious sister. So therefore, the first step of successfully raising a child, according to the Qur'an and the Sunnah, is not raising them, feeding them, sending them to the tafif, but it's who you get married to. Who you get married to. The Prophet والسلام, he tells us that when the son of Adam dies, you don't get no rewards in your grave. Your rewards are done. Kalas. Except for a few things. And from those few things, he says, Awaladin salihin yadrulahu. He says, Or a righteous son, a righteous daughter that prays for you after you die. And you can't have a righteous son or a righteous daughter unless you have a righteous mother, a righteous household, a righteous family. So that's the first step. And then the Prophet me instructs us and he informs us the supplications that we should make at the time of intimacy before the woman even conceives the child. Ask Allah to protect the shaitan from his rizq and to keep the rizq away from the shaitan. And when the child is born, the prayers and the supplications that you make, the halal food and drink that you provide your wife with, the household, what is done in the household. The Prophet ﷺ says, لا تجعلوا بيوتكم مقابر don't turn your houses into graveyards. shaytana, Because the devil runs from a house in which Surah Al-Baqarah is recited. And then when a child is born, you name the child. You shave the child's head. You make the aqiqah for the child. You give the child a good, strong name. You teach him the Qur'an. It's a process. And then when a the child is old enough, the child is sent to the imam at the masjid. Or sent to the sister at the masjid. And this brother, and this uncle, and this friend. And everyone in the village, be the night ta'ala, has a piece and a portion of making sure that this child remains safe and sound. So with this being said, brothers and sisters, with regards to the negative influences at college, the negative influences that your young sons and daughters may experience going to school, this hadith gives us a lot. And the first point, as we said, is to listen to your children. Listen to them. Don't shun them. Don't be so deluded and fooled to think that your child is better than the next person's child. And they're not going to fall into that fitna. And they're not going to fall victim to what everyone else is doing in college. Don't think that. Don't run, but engage. Don't be hasty. Don't be judgmental. Listen to your child. Have a conversation with them. Because at this point in stage, as we said, it's late in the game. And every single move counts. It's not early in the game when they're a young child. You did something wrong, you had a haram job, you weren't praying, there was domestic violence, and now you've recovered from that. But the child is 18, 20, 20, 25 years old, 23 years old. It's too late now for you to make any more mistakes. So talk with them, speak with them, conversate with them, and explain to them with Islam, and explain to them with logic and reason why it's bad to have a girlfriend, why it's bad to have a boyfriend. Why it's bad to do this? Why you can't have a job in which it doesn't allow you to make salat on time? Why the religion is so important? And how much you owe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? You owe Allah. You don't owe me. I sent you to school. I pay for your tuition. You owe Allah. Because if it wasn't for Allah, I wouldn't have no money, son. And you wouldn't be in college. If it wasn't for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his blessings, none of us will have anything that we have today. So it is your duty it is your responsibility to be a good Muslim. And negative influence is a reality. But we can't, have, we can't get into that right now because that's college in itself. Study in the dunya, around kuffar, non-Muslims. I play sports, they're my friends, we hang out. It's going to happen. The last piece of advice that I can give with regards to the topic is the statement of the Messenger of Allah, the well-known narration, the narration of Abu Musa al-Ash'ari, the Prophet he says, مثل الجليس الصالح والجليس السوء كبائع المسك ونافخ الكير. He says the likeness. If you had to make an example, if you wanted to make an example of a good friend and a bad friend, of a good influence and a bad influence, then it is as such. Number one, he says فبائع المسك إما أن يحذيك وإما أن تشتري منه أو تبتع منه وإما أن تشم منه ريحا طيبة. 
He says, one of three things is going to happen with a good friend, a good companion. One of three things. Number one, either he's going to give you some perfume for free. You're going to benefit from someone at school, at college, on your team that's a good friend, and he's going to help you out with nothing in return. He's going to be there for you even if you weren't there for him. He's going to do good for you, look out for you, even if he never asked you for anything in return. And that is the similitude of the perfume seller who gives you a free sample. Everyone likes to smell good. Everyone likes to look good. That's why the fashion industry and the perfume and the cologne industry is a multi-billion dollar industry. People like to smell good. Makes them feel a way when they smell good, when they look good. Everyone likes this. So who wouldn't want to look good or smell good for free? And that's the similitude of the good companion. And if you don't get something free from him, then at least you'll buy from him. You give him $10, $20, $50, that bottle of cologne is of no comparison to the money that you spent for it. Because when you have the cologne, or you have the oud, or you have the misk or the musk, you feel good, you feel confident, your wife likes it, the people, the brothers, they like it in the masjid. How, many, how much reward do you give by just giving someone oil in the masjid? The $50, the $20 is of no comparison. The one who's giving you the oil has a higher status than you giving him the money. And that's a benefit from a friend. And if you can't get something for free, if you can't buy anything from him, then at least, at the least, he says, ah, mashallah, that smells nice. What's the name of that fragrance? Okay, I'll come check you out later on. When I get paid, my next paycheck, or I'll think about buying something. At least that you enjoy something that's pleasant. And he says, the evil companion, the bad companion, the sinful companion. And don't think that this companion is just a non-Muslim, as many of us think. Your child goes to college, goes to school, says, stay away from non-Muslims. There are Muslims that are bad companions, that haven't been raised right, or have strayed from their fitrah, deviated from the natural way. He says, the bad companion, he says, kanaf al or kan haddad, is like a blacksmith, an ironsmith. Back in the day, quote unquote, when people made things, pots, Bowls or, or lids, swords, weapons, hoes, farming tools, they made them from iron. And then obviously man was educated by Allah. And he was taught certain things to make an alloy, to combine different types of metal, carbon, to make steel, bronze, and copper. So before you make these things, you have to burn them. Your forge has to be extremely hot. You know how hot a fire is? To melt and to turn metal, to turn this thing into liquid like lava. So obviously, one of the hardest things to do if you talk to a professional blacksmith or if you read about the old ways is the control of the fire and the temperature, the forge, and that is done through the bellows. When you puff or blow into it, the fire can't be too hot, it can't be too low. It has to be just perfect temperature to make what you're trying to make. He says, that's the similitude of the bad companion. إِمَّا أَنْ يُحْرِقَ ثِيَابَكَ Either he's going to burn your clothes if you get too close. If you approach this bad person too much, he's going to ruin your life and destroy your life. You're going to end up dead, in jail, not a Muslim, scarred for life, some type of major sexually transmitted infection or disease. You're going to lose your potential, the talent, the ability that you had to do something in life is going to be gone. Being in the wrong place, the wrong time, at the wrong place with the wrong person. Like I said about the youths that were in jail. And if you don't get that close, and your life isn't ruined, he says, It smells horrible, it's putrid, sulfur and copper and these things burning. Nothing about it is a pleasant smell. And that's the similitude of a bad campaign. He's going to wear off on you. He's going to rub off on you. And if you don't leave Islam, no doubt your Islam is going to be damaged. If you don't totally drop out of school, your grades will be affected. Your study habits will be affected. And for those who are saying, well, I don't like to study. I don't want to go to school. I want to play basketball. I want to play football. I want to do this. I want to do that. Okay, no problem. You read about these football players, these basketball players, these champions, the millions of dollars that they make playing. And that doesn't include endorsements, advertisements, sneakers, shoes. When they retire, they become commentators, broadcasters. It's a life full of wealth. Do you know how many hours they study? How many hours they practice? Do you know the physical punishment and torture that this boxer is putting himself through just to fight this one fight? 
Do you know how many hours it takes this football player is watching and studying when everyone else is drinking and partying? He's in the room watching and breaking down how to read and pick apart the defense. So you can't be a successful football player. You can't be a successful basketball player. You can't be a successful rapper or musician if you have bad company. I'm trying to study and work out. I want to write my raps. No, let's go smoke. Let's go do this. Let's go drink. Let's go here. This girl's house. You can't, you can't win if you have evil company in any aspect of life, let alone as a Muslim. Huh? Let alone as a Muslim. And obviously, kids who grow up, everyone wants to be a basketball player, a football player. I want to be a doctor. I want to be this. You don't understand the amount of sacrifice that it takes to be successful. And that sacrifice with bad companions and evil companions, non-Muslim, Muslims that are bad Muslims is like water and oil. They never, ever mix. So that's my advice to the youth, and that's my advice to the elders. And obviously, you can forgive me and pardon me for giving you advice. You're older than me. However, I was requested to come and deliver a message, and that's my responsibility to do. And inshallah ta'ala, no one is offended or disrespected by this. Whereas a young person coming and speaking to elders how can he tell us how to raise a family? He doesn't have a beard on his face. That's my job and that's my responsibility. And it's not for me to be affected and bend and care at what people think and feel. Because I have to stand in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So I ask Allah to guide our Muslim youth. And I ask Allah to protect our Muslim youth. I ask Allah to make our Muslim youth successful in this life and in the hereafter. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow the relationship between the parents and the youth to be one that is strong and healthy. And we ask Allah Azza wa to make the fathers better fathers, to make the mothers better mothers, and to make the sons and the daughters better sons and daughters. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana, wa fil akhirati hasana, wa qina adhab al-nar, wa akhir da'wana an alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen, wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala abdihi wa rasulihi nabina wa imamina Muhammad, jazakumullah khayran. Thank you very much for your time, for your attention and for your respect. To my hajj buddy, jazakumullah khayran. All the stories that he told you about hajj are true about knowledge and this and that and scholars, they aren't true, but we did make hajj together and we do have a relationship, but all of that other stuff, I don't know about that. <laughs> uh, if anyone has anything they would like to add or comment on or any questions on the topic, or off the topic, you're free to do so. And once again, after thanking Allah, I thank all of you for your invitation and bringing me out to your masjid and to your center. May Allah Azzawajal reward you well. And also my companion, my travel buddy, quote unquote, my road dog, huh? May Allah Azza bless you and forgive you of your sins as well. <laughs>